Greetings, everybody. Peter Maravellis here. Tonight on City Lights Live, we are celebrating the release of a new book published by City Lights Books. As many of you know, City Lights is a publishing house as well as a bookstore, so it is a great pleasure to be hosting one of our own titles. City Lights Live is the virtual reading series that follows in the footsteps of our in-store calendar during the time of the pandemic. We are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral grounds of the Ramatushaloni peoples from where we continue to celebrate the works of authors we know and love with readings, discussions, and forums moving towards the winter solstice and hopefully towards a COVID-free era. We're pleased to have with us tonight Christopher W. Shaw celebrating his new book. It's titled First Class, The U.S. Postal Service, Democracy, and the Corporate Threat. In it, he explores the fight over the future of the U.S. Postal Service. Political ideologues and corporate interests have long sought to remake the U.S. Postal Service from a public institution into a private business. Uh, this has enormous consequences for American democracy. Mr. Shaw explores the history of the Postal Service and considers the importance of fighting to maintain the institution. Christopher Shaw is an author, historian, and policy analyst. He's the author of Money, Power, and the People, the American struggle to make banking democratic. Uh, also, uh, preserving the people's post office. Uh, his research on the history of banking, money, labor, agriculture, social movements, and the postal system has been published in numerous academic journals. These include Journal of Policy History, Journal of Social History, Agricultural History, Enterprise and Society, and many others. Mr. Shaw was formerly a project director at the Center for the Study of Responsive Law. He has worked on a number of policy issues, including the privatization of government services, health and safety regulations, and electoral reform. He has appeared in such media outlets as National Public Radio, The Washington Post, The Philadelphia Inquirer, amongst others. He makes his home in Berkeley, California. He will be joined tonight in conversation by phone by none other than Ralph Nader. Mr. Nader needs little introduction. Named by the Atlantic Monthly as one of the 100 most influential figures in American history and by Time and Life magazines as one of the most influential Americans of the 20th century, Mr. Nader has helped us drive safer cars, eat healthier food, breathe better air, drink cleaner water, and work in safer environments for more than four decades. Moderating tonight's event is going to be Catherine Isaac, Ms. Isaac is the executive director of the Debs Jones Douglas Institute, where she advocates for the public good, including a strong and expanded public postal service. Previously, Ms. Isaac coordinated the Campaign for Postal Banking and a Grand Alliance to Save Our Public Postal Service at the American Postal Workers Union. She currently serves as board treasurer of the Global Labor Justice International Labor Rights Forum. Ms. Isaac is also the author of Civics for Democracy, A Journey for Teachers and Students. And so without much more ado, please join us now in giving a warm welcome to Christopher W. Shaw, to Ralph Nader, and to Catherine Isaac. Welcome to City Lights Live. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I'm Catherine Isaac, and also thank you to City Lights Books. It's such a pleasure to be here tonight with Christopher Shaw and with Ralph Nader. So Chris's new book is not only fascinating, it's so important to the struggle to protect and expand our public postal service. Chris and, Ralph are, Chris and Ralph are gonna be talking tonight about the importance of the postal service throughout our country's history and who's behind the effort to dismantle it and then what we can do to save it. The fight over whether the US Postal Service should operate as a public good or as a private business has been going on for decades. But in 2020, with a raging pandemic and a contentious presidential election, many Americans woke up to the importance of a public postal service to the very survival of our democracy. So let's get started with our first question. Can each of you address why the postal service is under attack? Who's behind the attacks and who stands to benefit? Chris, do you wanna start? Sure, so there's a constellation of uh, interest groups here that would like to see the Postal Service become uh, more business-like or even privatized. And among them are uh, ideologues who just don't believe in government services. They don't want government regulations. They don't want, they don't like labor unions either. And all of these things are present in the Postal Service and present in our lives on a daily basis. So it's made the Postal Service a major target 
for these kinds of um, anti-government, anti-public service, anti-union attacks. And so you have well-funded uh, think tanks and organizations that have been behind this for decades. You also have interest groups with very sort of more specific uh, business motivations uh, to attack the Postal Service who are hoping to get uh, aspects of the postal system contracted out to them so they can make money on that, or they are hoping to uh, prevent uh, postal service uh, competition. So they deliver packages, for instance, and they would like to have the postal service do that as ineffectively as uh, possible. So there's a whole set of really uh, quite well-funded, quite powerful interest groups um, that have an interest here, and it is not an interest that aligns with what the American people want and need, which is a well-funded, um, expanding and healthy and vibrant uh, postal system. Ralph, you want to jump in? Yeah, uh, just to, to, uh, to correct the widespread impression, the Postal Service is not supported by taxpayers. It's uh, self-supported. Uh, it's gotten into debt because of what Chris points out in his book. They required pre-funding for decades of the health insurance, which no company or no government agency has ever been required or willing to do. And that cost them billions of dollars every year. And that was a result. Of, uh, yeah, that was the result of uh, a bill passed in Congress in uh, 2006, I believe. So that, that should be erased because the propaganda is, it often gives the implication that uh, uh, the Postal Service is a drain on the taxpayer, which simply isn't true. Yeah, so uh, that was going to be my next question about the, the manufactured financial crisis, right? I think a lot of people think that the Postal Service is losing money because technology like email has uh, uh, caused a decline in first class mail, but package delivery has also skyrocketed in the last decade. So, um, Chris, do you want to talk a little bit more about that 2006 law that created all of this? Right. Yeah, this is not a crisis that was created by technology. It's not email that did this. It's uh, Congress that did it when, uh, due to concerns about the federal budget deficit, they came up with this pre-funding schedule, which is very aggressive. No private corporation, no government agency, nobody attempts to try to pay decades in advance a health care a retiree fund, which is what the Postal Service is mandated to do. And so the reason this happened is that the Postal Service is actually overpaid into its retiree health fund and returning that money to the Postal Service would have had a negative impact on the federal budget deficit. So they put, it in, put that money into an escrow account rather than returning it and then came up with this plan to basically have the Postal Service uh, pay into it decades in advance to sort of offset um, that, uh, that, that fund, those funds that would be uh, return to the Postal Service. And this is really responsible for almost all of the financial problems the, the Postal Service has had. If you actually look at the income coming in, the cash flow that the Postal Service gets on an annual basis, it's pretty much been, um, in some cases, actually coming out ahead, um, but it's basically been breaking even. And you know the institution is designed to break even. That is what it's supposed to do. Um, so the financial crisis is a manufacturer crisis. It is a bookkeeping and accounting issue. Do other government agencies have to do this? No, right I mean, yeah, typically you're going to have uh, more of a pay as you go model. So there's no reason why uh, you would be paying for retirees who aren't working for the Postal Service yet, and in some cases may not even have been born yet. And that is what the Postal Service is uh, attempting to do or has been mandated to do by Congress. Right, thanks. So we've heard a lot. Uh, in the last year or so about Postmaster General Louis DeJoy uh, bringing his business expertise to management of the Postal Service. He has a 10-year plan that includes cutting service and raising rates. Ralph, can you tell us what the strategy is really all about and where you think it would lead? Well, they want to wreck the Postal Service as a public service because, let's face it, it's a multi-billion dollar operation and groups like FedEx, United Parcel, all the various groups that want a piece of that. And if they degrade the post office, starve it, keep raising the rates, reducing the service, it can now take three, four days 
or more to go from New York uh, to California uh, first class, sometimes a week. Uh, DeJoy has slowed down the standards of service for some categories here. If they degrade it, then, you know, they can get Congress to say, oh, well, let's just uh, give it to the corporations. They use the word privatization, but it's actually corporatization. Now, the loss here is how would you like to send a letter depending on how many miles the destination is? Like from Seattle to Miami, it's six times what it is from Seattle to uh, Portland. And uh, how would you like a postal service where you have all kinds of people uh, trying to deliver different categories of mail in the, in the neighborhood with different trucks? How would you like a postal service where uh, you don't have the standard of universality uh, that the postal service has ever since Benjamin Franklin thought the idea up? Uh, and there are other things. There are emergency uh, use of the postal service. Uh, you know, when you have a pandemic, you got to get medicines around or you have uh, – uh, uh, a epidemic. You have to get medicines around. And with 32,000 or so outlets, there's nothing that can compare with the Postal Service. If you ever corporatized it, they'd start uh, reducing the number of outlets in communities all over the country and concentrating them in fewer and fewer buildings. So that's just part of it. And I'm sure Chris, in his book, uh, can elaborate a lot more that relates to people's daily lives. You know, it makes a difference when you have people delivering every day. Sometimes there's an emergency in the home, and they come, and they rescue, and they save lives. We're, I, I'm taking Chris's book and giving it to the postal delivery people in my hometown and also giving it to the post office because they need to have this kind of background because once they start arguing to preserve and expand the postal system, uh, nothing's going to stop them. They've got a lot of people, and they got to be, be, uh, be uh, fortified with the whole history of what the Postal Service has done, and it could expand. Uh, Congress prohibits them from uh, shipping beer and wine. Why? That's a, that's a big revenue. So they got their hands tied in so many different ways. Chris? Well, yeah, I mean, there's a, just a big mess, misapprehension and misidentification of what the Postal Service is, because it is a public service. That's what it is. And when you have a Postmaster General who comes in with no background in public service, with no background in the Postal Service, who has a, a mistaken idea of what it's about, who thinks it's about being a business, then they are going to run it in a way that all of those intangible benefits, all of those ways that the Postal Service um, helps us in our daily lives, those don't count anymore. The rural post office, that's the center for community identity, that's a center for where people meet each other, that's a community building space, um, that doesn't count under that logic, under that calculus of a, a business mindset. And it goes against the entire history of what the post office has been, as, as Ralph said, dating back to Benjamin Franklin, where the idea was that it existed to serve a higher need and a larger purposes, and that's what it has done. Uh, for centuries. And there is a lack of appreciation for that that we see um, with the current uh, management uh, at the Postal Service, unfortunately. So speaking of the current management, uh, there's also a board of governors, right, that that uh, has a lot to do with how the uh, Postal Service is managed. Is that pro-business attitude of Louis DeJoy also reflected there? Um, well, that's a, a really important point, because I'll, just one thing just to say, I mean, a lot of people wonder, why is Louis DeJoy still Postmaster General? Why hasn't President Biden gotten rid of him? And the reason is because he does not answer directly to uh, President Biden anymore. Um, ever since 1971, the Postmaster General answers to a board of governors. The members of that board are presidential appointees. They go through a Senate confirmation uh, process. Um, but so... The board right there, um, there's some changes that have just happened just as of a couple of days ago. Uh, but essentially, the reason that DeJoy is there is because you had six Trump appointees who selected him. And now two of those uh, board of governors, their term is over. They were not reappointed by President Biden. There are some new uh, nominees, and they will go through a Senate confirmation process. There's not a date to my knowledge that we have just yet, but it should happen in the next couple of months. And then at that point, 
we'll have a different composition on the Board of Governors and um, hopefully one that has more appreciation for the public service uh, role of the, of the post office and um, does not just see it in a mindset like Louis DeJoy said, where he's there to drive out costs. Well, you know, we wanna be efficient, yes, but that should not be the primary goal of how you manage the postal service is to drive out costs. Ralph, you've seen lots of uh, postmaster generals come and go. Um, is, it, is it always like this? Does it have to be this way? No, it doesn't. It's just uh, even before DeJoy, we had problems with the postmaster general. They, they just, uh, they, they're very much taken with running the post office like a corporate business. They don't pay attention to the intangibles. How do you put a price on millions of people going to their local post office, finding out all kinds of things about public services by the federal government? It's, it's not just postal services. The post office is the federal presence in these communities all over the country and it can provide all kinds of information that people need. How do you put a price on people getting together in the post office, waiting in line, they start out conversations. They're not looking at each other through virtual reality screens. And they say, hey, how about this? And, you know, there's a meeting coming up uh, to improve this neighborhood down the street or whatever. So there are a lot of intangibles. I once, uh, <clears throat> I once uh, collected some examples about uh, rescue efforts by postal delivery people. When they come out and they hear a cry of pain, somebody's living alone, and they connect the person with emergency. How do you put a price on that? And you can imagine how this will completely disappear if uh, corporate offices replace the Postal Service. That's never going to happen. Uh, there's tremendous support for the Postal Service. That was seen in 2020 when Trump tried to use it to pursue his own uh, goals and slow down uh, uh, absentee ballots. And we we're all surprised by the huge support that comes out. So there's a lot of latent support. And what Chris's book's trying to do is to make this support informed and overt. Like if you ever give a, a little gift to your postal delivery person, give, give that person a book to read. I, I know a lot of people who give little Christmas gifts to their postal delivery person who who comes up, rain, shine, snow, ice, doesn't matter, dogs. And so give them this book. That's a great idea. Uh, I love that idea of giving the book to, to, your, letter, to your letter carrier or your postal clerk at your post office. Um, so as you, as you just mentioned, the, the attacks on the Postal Service predate Louis DeJoy. Uh, one example is from 2014. And that was a plan to move postal services into Staples office supply stores. Um, Chris, you write about this in your book as, as an example, both of, of the way the, that management has wanted to chip away at our, at our network of, of post offices, but also as a successful public fight to, to um, counter it. Um, and that fight was led by the American Postal Workers Union. Can you talk a little bit about that? That was an important fight because it was an important moment where you did see uh, certainly the American Postal Workers Union took the lead, but then you had support from other uh, citizen groups, um, from other unions that you saw that there was this broader support uh, to maintain public postal services because what they were trying to do is basically just close down post offices. I mean, that seems to have been the objective and the goal and instead to move those postal transactions into private businesses. So into a staples, but there was also evidence that there were other um, corporations that the Postal Service was in, uh, having conversations with about uh, moving those transactions in there as well. And so uh, you got the, the postal unions and these uh, civic organizations and they, they organized and they, and they held protests. Uh, one important group uh, was teachers uh, because a large proportion of the uh, staple sales is to uh, teachers and they joined in the boycott as well. And it was effective. Um, in some places, you, you had people rallying out there on, on the weekends for, for literally years. Um, but it was effective. And the, and the Postal Service management decided that um, they would not continue to try to pursue uh, this, uh, this idea. And um, you know, there's, there's lots of issues with it there. It's, 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 a, it's a privatization. It's also um, the security of the, of the mail. 
of the US mail. Um, there is not the same type of rules or training in place for non-postal employees. Uh, so that was an, an important victory. And I think in a lot of ways, it kind of was foreshadowed uh, what happened in 2020, uh, which Ralph was talking about, where you really did then have uh, you know, a big citizen outpouring of support for the, for the Postal Service. So that was a big victory. And, and I might say, uh, Catherine and the listeners, uh, any of you are members of unions, the union should really get copies of this book and give it to the locals all over the country. I know Mr. Dimenstein told me he wanted to do that when he heard of uh, uh, Chris's book being published by City Lights. It's online. Uh, buy it directly from City Lights. Help that Valiant bookstore in San Francisco if you can avoid buying it from Amazon or some other large uh, seller. The other thing is I just heard on NPR they got the Postal Service advertising stamps in these chain, chain stores, these big box stores. How, how are they continuing doing it? Why are they spending advertising dollars promoting stamp sales for outfits like uh, Home Depot or Staples or Starbucks in, instead of advancing uh, their own services and touting their own services? Yeah, I, I noticed that during the Staples fight that NPR, um, that Staples is a sponsor of, of NPR. And, and I never heard a story, I could be wrong, but I never heard a story covering the, the, um, the fight to keep our, our post offices open. So um, that's our national public radio. But um, yeah, I, I love the idea of getting, getting the book into the hands of postal workers too, because Chris, uh, tells the amazing history of the importance of the Postal Service and the importance of postal workers um, all through the history of our country. And I think it's something that postal workers should be very proud of and, and should know more about. So um, I, like, I like that idea. Um, so speaking of postal workers, the pandemic forced many Americans to see some for the first time how much, we, how much we rely on essential workers, including, of course, postal workers. Um, Chris, can you talk a little bit more about the role of postal jobs in uh, opening up economic opportunity um, for people of color as well as for veterans? The Postal Service for many years has uh, employed a very high proportion of uh, uh, Black workers and, and veterans uh, who are returning to the civilian labor force um, in comparison to uh, the, the broader uh, labor force. And so uh, black workers uh, found dating back to the really the late 19th and early 20th century that uh, there was a less discrimination at the post office than there was out in the general uh, private, you know, trying to get a job from a, uh, other employers. And so it served as a real um, entryway and, and gateway towards uh, financial stability, uh, towards the middle class. Um, you also see, for instance, I've, I've seen um, interesting things where in the South during the civil rights movement, you had uh, postal workers who were independent economically from uh, people who were opposed to the civil rights movement in that region. And they were therefore better able to, to organize and um, to uh, fight for their civil rights and their, and their voting rights. Um, so it's uh, played an important uh, economic and, and social role, certainly in, in black communities. And then for uh, veterans, um, the percentage of veterans in the postal workforce has been significantly higher. And this also includes disabled veterans uh, than the general labor force. And it really is a, a place where you have people who they, they serve uh, their country in uniform in the military, and then they go and they serve their country in uniform at the postal service. And it has allowed a lot of people to have uh, a middle-class living standard um, and a decent retirement. So uh, it's really a, a bedrock of the middle class in this country. It has been for many years and for generations. Ralph, you want to add anything there? Yeah, that these jobs are uh, well paid and they have good benefits. They're not just low paid jobs. Yeah. And uh, that's because of the unions. Right. And, and the, the corporatists, the corporate supremacists uh, want to get rid of unions. And that's one reason why they don't like the post office. Yeah, and those jobs, the, the decent paying jobs with good benefits, um, you know, it's also just uh, a real um, uh, 
counter to our rising income inequality, right? And I, you know, so it's not just something that happened in the past. It's, it's just absolutely vital now. Um, there are about 600,000 workers in the, in the postal service. And uh, just one, one more reason to, to fight to, to protect and strengthen it. So I wanna turn now to um, the, the post office has, has been, the postal service has been highly innovative throughout its history. And there are a lot of ideas out there today for expanding the role of the postal service including offering financial services, which is also called postal banking. So Chris, you've written uh, another book about uh, postal banking and um, have studied this issue extensively, and it's included in, in this book as well, of course. Um, can you talk a little bit about the history of postal banking and then um, how, you see, how you see it moving forward and, and, and winning it again? Yeah, so uh, postal banking is really a, a great uh, example of citizen action defeating powerful special interests. Because what happened is in the late 19th and early 20th century, you had just sort of average workers and farmers who were not being served by banks, who were being ripped off by banks, and they got out there and they organized for many years to get a bank at the post office. If the banks aren't going to serve us, they aren't interested in us, they want to rip us off, well, the government is uh, an alternative. And so they uh, campaigned hard to get uh, savings banks set up at the post office. And it operated, um, it gets running in 1911. It was accepting deposits through 1966. Millions of Americans deposited billions of dollars in it during that time. Um, it was an important place uh, during the, the Great Depression, especially when banks were fall, failing left and right. But the thing is the banking lobby was against it the entire time. Um, they opposed the idea, and um, ultimately in the 1960s, that kind of civic energy that had gotten the postal banking established in the first place uh, wasn't as strong. And the banks, though, they stayed in the game the whole time, and so they were able to lobby it out of existence. And the thing is that today we have a similar equation where there are around 8 million households in this country that do not have bank accounts. Um, so they are experiencing financial exclusion. They have to go to uh, fringe banking providers like uh, check cashing outlets, like pawn shops, like payday loans, just to do basic things like uh, transact a paycheck. Um, and that can be expensive. And when you're living on a, on a low income as the vast majority of these people are, uh, that's spare extra money that you do not have. Um, so we have a similar situation now, hundred years later from when we first got the uh, post office, uh, postal saving system up and running. And um, there's an obvious solution, which is, there are over 30,000 post offices around the country, uh, agency that is not out there trying to meet quarterly profit goals uh, that can be more flexible and adaptable to the kind of bank account needs of uh, people who are not on, who not have bank accounts. And so there's a yet again another a movement to uh, get postal banking in the nation's post offices again. And there's been the first step towards that um, in decades that just happened where um, it's very small at the moment. There's only four post offices and a uh, one in the Bronx, one in uh, Baltimore, uh, one in Washington, D.C., and one in Falls uh, Church, Virginia. Uh, but they are actually willing to, uh, you can go into those post offices and you can cash a, a payroll or a business check. Uh, so uh, it's a small start, but it's um, coming from absolutely nothing. It's, it is a big step. And it's, this is something also that post offices around the world, they offer financial services. This is a very standard thing. Uh, the U.S. is actually anomalous in, in not offering this. So I think it um, provides a great way for the post office to serve the American people um, in a new way, but also an old way it's done before. And it's really, uh, you know, it's, it's a future. It's the future. It's the future. And, it, and it's where the Postal Service uh, needs, to, needs to go uh, to, to provide uh, more service to, to the American people. And increasing support in Congress, too, Chris. As, of course, Senator Warren, Senator Sanders, and others on the progressive core are, have all, uh, all spoken out in favor of it. And uh, there are going to be Republicans in favor of it because a lot of Republicans come from rural areas, and the post office is even more crucial in rural areas. And so it doesn't become a red state, blue state at all. That's right. The, the, the need for banking services are just as great in rural areas as they are in, in urban ones. Uh, good point. So what about what about other ideas for uh, how the po Postal Service could better serve the public? 
Well, I, I think Ralph was pointing to some of those just in terms of the fact that it is uh, the face of the government in all of these communities. And while you can go in there and you can get a voter registration form or, you know, there's no reason that shouldn't really be brought in out to a lot of other things. So people talk about hunting and fishing licenses. Another thing people have discussed is a way to access um, health care services or the Social Security Administration has been closing down Social Security offices. So it could be provide a, you know, it wouldn't have everything that a Social Security office uh, has, but it would provide a, a way to do that. So really as a, as a portal, as, a, as an outlet, as a, a public face of the federal government, where you could become aware of all the services that, that exist, because a lot of people, they aren't really aware uh, necessarily of these things. I mean, um, Ralph is very interested, for instance, in all those documents that the government publishing office uh, prints, right? Well, there's a lot of information there that people aren't necessarily able to access or, or know about. And so getting all those uh, aspects of the government, federal government into uh, the post offices in the nation, um, that would be uh, you know, something that, that could be important. And um, you know, it should be there, I, I think. So I think that that's, that's one, um, one direction. Uh, another thing is uh, the Postal Service has looked into electronic communications in the past, and I don't see why it, there shouldn't be more serious study of why not having a USPS.gov email address or potentially even a postal search engine. We have these tech companies that have turned their users uh, essentially you know, into sources of, of information where they surveil them, where you turn yourself into the product when you're, when you're using these, and there's a potential for a civic nonprofit way to do electronic communication. So uh, these are just some of the ideas, but you know, there's a lot of uh, creative ideas out there. And I think that, uh, you know, I hope that this book can serve as something of a starting point of, not that this discussion isn't already underway, but can help further that discussion and get people uh, thinking about the post office in creative uh, ways uh, going forward. We should also remember that tens of millions of people are not online. And for example, the Federal Trade Commission has very good pamphlets on how you can save money in one area of the marketplace after the other in terms of credit, insurance, uh, banking, automobiles. Uh, and uh, that's where you can find out what you can get in print. We've got to recognize there are tens of millions of people that are not online for a whole variety of reasons, and the post office can provide that with a link to the government printing office in Washington, D.C. that was started by Abraham Lincoln, who called it the People's Printer. Yeah, there's also all kinds of ideas about how the Postal Service could um, help fuel a green economy. We could have electric car charging stations, solar panels on the processing plants, um, uh, also things like uh, letter carriers could deliver groceries um, fresh from local farms, lots of ideas, it, you know, it's, 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 it belongs to us, it's got an amazing infrastructure and we ought to, to really put it to use to serve the public. So well, remember when you hear arguments uh, that, you know, oh, the post office is going to have to have government support, who do you think supports all these big profitable corporations? They wouldn't exist without federal government research and development over the years, you paid for it as taxpayer. They helped develop the aerospace industry. A lot of pharmaceuticals come out of the National Institutes of Health Research, the nan nanotechnology, biotechnology, computer industry. The Pentagon did the research for the internet. The containerization industry exists because of research from the U.S. Navy. So don't, don't let them uh, pigeonhole you and say, oh, you know, you, you, it's going to be a war to the taxpayer. Uh, the Congress is about to give $50 billion to the richest corporations in the country, the chip manufacturers who don't have the patriotism to keep the factories here. They go for surf labor in China and elsewhere, and now they have to be bribed with $50 billion of your dollars to build some of the factories here when they're making ha money hand over fist and their stock is going through the roof. So we got to got to know how to argue for these public institutions because we're up against propaganda, lies, and the corporatists. So Ralph, I have a question for you. You've long advocated for the creation of a citizens group to advocate on behalf of the P public postal service. Your idea has a unique funding mechanism and could be a real game changer. Can you tell us what this idea is all about? Right. That's uh, described in some detail in Chris's book, First Class, which I hope all of you keep in mind, because 
We want to support City Lights. We want to support uh, Chris. Uh, but we want to get the word out in book form. And, and this is one of the purposes of this uh, uh, this Zoom conference. Uh, yeah, this is really simple. How many of you have gotten uh, postcards from the Postal Service saying, well, we, we can help in packaging, we can do this, and they notify you about certain services, right? Well, suppose, say, six times a year, you get in the, in the mail uh, an invitation to join a residential postal consumer group uh, that would have full-time staff, both regionally and in Washington, to get a seat at the table and fight for the residential postal users of America. There are a lot of people now who don't get the post postal service at home. They got to go down sometime in ice and snow by the road and get it from their post box. And that's increasingly the case. That's another deterioration of postal service imposed by uh, congressional strict strictures. Okay, so you have, we call it POCAG, this residential uh, consumer group. So let's say you get six in the mail like this, a very little incremental cost, right? I mean, the post office is delivering other mail. This is you know, not going to require new trucks and new workers to deliver six little invitations. Would you like to join and support full-time champions uh, that can... Uh, reflect economic knowledge, technical knowledge, environmental knowledge, all kinds of uh, expertise uh, to focus on Congress, focus on the Postal Board of Governors, uh, improve service in the community, like one post office in this community has this light on outside 24 hours a day, wasting electricity, because it's promoted that way by the electric company. Well, that's something to look into. Little, but it adds up. So this is a good idea. It's described in uh, Chris's book. Now, let's say just one out of 100 homes or apartments joined. Can you imagine what that would be? That's like um, a million and a half or more people. And let's say it's 15, 20 bucks each. You got real power there representing you, right down to your personal complaints. If you have personal complaints about the service, if the post office is always busy in its telephone line, it doesn't answer the phone right away, you got someone to go to bat for you. Uh, and uh, the same is true for getting better trucks uh, that are electric trucks, reduce pollution, uh, unlike the, uh, uh, the Amazon trucks that are starting to appear in your uh, community. So it's very simple. Uh, the the whole is always greater than the sum of its parts. So always keep that in mind. Less than 1% of the people who know what they're talking about, who band together, who reflect a large public opinion, often conservative, liberal, can turn Congress around against the most powerful corporate forces. It's been done in the past. It can be done now. POCAG is the name of the idea. It's in First Class by Christopher Shaw, just out, City Lights. How's that for a plug, Chris? <laughs> Thanks, Ralph. Good one. Thanks. So I'm going to ask you guys a broad question now. The, the, the post office, which is older than our country itself and is, is, and is enshrined in the Constitution, was created to serve the public good. Why do you think it's so vital to keep it public? What's at stake for our democracy, our economy, and our communities? Well, I think the fact that it's public is what makes it democratic. I mean, the Postal Service is remarkable in the fact that it is actually a democratic public service. It serves everybody equally. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter what your income is. None of these other characteristics that in our uh, consumerist and, and capitalist society determine the level to which you get to receive a, a service. None of those matter. You're, we're all equal in the eyes of the Postal Service. So I think it's an affirmation of democracy in our, in our lives. Um, when we get the mail delivered uh, six days a week. Um, I think that also another important way in which we see the necessity of it was the 2020 election when we had an unforeseen pandemic and we had to be able to vote. And thank, thank, thankfully we had this amazing infrastructure and this network in place that allowed us all to vote. So our democracy, just ability to function uh, is becoming increasingly reliant on the, on the postal service. Uh, so- and also 
uh, and also, uh, uh, Chris, public service means it relates to the needs of the people, not the profits of the institution. Like if if it was corporatized and, and different kinds of companies uh, provided uh, mail delivery. For example, a lot of people under 50, maybe under 60, who knows, uh, don't even know that the postal uh, uh, system used to deliver twice a day in in communities. You'd put a letter in the mail in the morning in the town and the per, or a city, and they'd get, uh, the the person address would get it the, in the afternoon. They used to deliver eggs. The postal service in the 1920s. Uh, why? Because they were meeting needs. They weren't meeting bonuses, stock options, stock buybacks, huge executive salaries. So what Chris is saying can be elaborated in your own experience. When you have institutions that respond to needs, needs, not vendor profits maximization, uh, you're going to get a broader variety of quality in the community. And yeah, just to, to speak to that point, I'll just um, add in terms of responding to needs. The reason that we actually get packages in the mail is because there was a real need in the early 20th century for a public alternative to a cartel of private uh, delivery companies that were price gouging uh, people. They literally sort of gotten together, divided up the country so they each had their own territory. And then they had this incredibly convoluted uh, rate system in terms of what it cost to send, send packages. The service was inadequate. And so you had a citizen grassroots campaign to get the post office in the business of delivering packages. Um, and it starts doing that with Parcel Post in 1913. So there was a need, uh, citizen response, and a result. And so that's why we get packages uh, today. And I once was in Australia, and I, I noticed there weren't that many citizen groups in Australia compared to the U.S. And uh, the same was true for New Zealand. The same was true for England, other English-speaking countries. And, and so I started looking into it. You know what a key reason was? Key reason was postal rates were much lower in the United States, much lower than in Britain and Australia. Why? Because the policy of a government was to have very, very cheap postal rates for newspapers so they could be put in the mail and delivered right away. And because nonprofits like Public Citizen and others could mail out uh, solicitation for contributions and membership with a fraction of the postal costs that comparable groups in Australia and England would have to pay. So this is changing now, and the gap is getting smaller between the U.S. and those countries because the, the rates are going up. In 1970, when I started Public Citizen, it cost a penny and a half to put in a nonprofit mail uh, letter inviting people to contribute and join to Public Citizen. And now, what is it, Chris? About a quarter, 25% or more. Uh, so you see, it was designed to facilitate not only binding the people of the country together through an integrated universal service postal system, it was designed to facilitate the expansion of the civic communities, local, state, and national, of our country. So that's why the history that's in Chris's book is so critical, because what history does, it raises your expectation levels as to what was in the past can also be in the future. I don't see in communities people coming out of their homes, taking letters to a nearby post box, big blue post box. There are hardly any of them anymore. They have to get into a car and go and drive down to the postal branch or the post office. That's because of the way they strip mined the post office over the years, before Chris started writing his books and before we started mounting uh, a civic drive uh, to expand postal services and to inform people about what, they're, what they've lost already and how much more they can lose if they don't recover the postal system, expand it with postal savings and other things that are described and very doable in Chris's book, First Class. Please get it. And I see from the comments in the chat that lots of folks are getting it. Uh, it's, it is a really important book. It'll, it'll tell you everything you need to know to, to join in this fight to save the uh, public postal service. So I'm going to ask Ralph and Chris one more question, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. 
So the Postal Service is the most popular government agency. And believe it or not, that holds true for millennials and Gen Z as well. It's essential that we protect it. How can listeners get involved in the fight to protect, preserve, and expand the public postal service? Well, this is a Ralph Nader specialty on um, how citizens can make their voice heard. But one thing is to let your members of Congress know that this is an issue you care about, that you care about the Postal Service and you want it to remain uh, a public service and you want it to maintain true to its historic uh, mission. And then there's a number of organizations that you can uh, turn to uh, for information and that also help to organize those campaigns and help to make uh, voices heard uh, in Congress. And among those is the, uh, the Grand Alliance, um, which is at agrandalliance.org. Um, there's also uh, the American Postal Workers Union can help with that. Um, US Mail Not For Sale. Uh, .org is another one, uh, savethepostoffice.com. Um, so there's a number of organizations out there. Um, and I believe we're gonna put that up for everyone to see um, here uh, soon. Yes, you can see links. Listeners should know, listeners know Catherine Isaac was a prime organizer of this uh, alliance a few years ago and has a big coalition. Uh, but as we know about coalitions, it's, it, you got to activate the members who are part of the coalition. Here are some suggestions I have. Chris pointed to one. Congress is the pivot here. And uh, uh, members of Congress are very sensitive about people uh, complaining about strip mining postal services, reducing services and increasing uh, rates. And, and Congress can make things happen for the good. So it's the Congress, it's the Congress, which means you two senators and representatives Drop them a line, tell them what you want, ask them to send you a letter back. By the way, in Canada, people can send a letter to their member of parliament free. Uh, in the U.S., uh, members of Congress can send letters to you free, but you can't send letters <laughs> to your senators and representatives free. Another question you might ask. But anyway, uh, focus on your two senators and representatives. Uh, they can solve a lot of the problems and avoid a lot of the restrictions that are now hampering uh, what the Postal Service can deliver, like beer and wine. That's one. The second is, why not have a parade once a year uh, in honor of the Postal Service in your community and all the postal workers? There are a lot of small towns. They have nice, long main streets. And you just have a parade and bring people together and be bring them uh, to realize how important this uh, this, well, you might call it uh, a, a gathering place. It's not just, you know, packages, letters, and stamps. It's a gathering place in, in an increasingly impersonal, uh, automated, uh, virtual reality uh, society that we have here. And then the third thing, we did this in our community once there was a, an attempt to uh, restrict service, and, and we had a demonstration in front of the local post office, and it made the state television news that night. Uh, sometimes the television news gets tired of just uh, reporting street crimes, avoiding corporate crimes, and uh, they want something like that. It made the whole state uh, television news, just uh, 15 people with signs. Um, then the other thing is um, give this book. This book should be in the hands of all the locals for the union and it should be in the hands of the postal delivery. Just think uh, how easy that delivery system is when you just put a little note in, in, in your mail basket or your, your box and you say, this is for you, postal delivery. This is for you, the letter carrier. Um, and the, the last thing uh, I might add is talk it up among your neighbors and, you know, Big talk should replace small talk once in a while. And people love to talk about the post office. You know, they have their complaints. They have the, they're grumbling at times. But they have a lot of nice stories to say about the letter carriers, about the post office, the art in, from the 1930s in a lot of these post offices. A lot of the people in the, in, waiting in line are, are your friends and neighbors. You would never contact them otherwise. So... There are a lot of things and a lot of things that you can do to start POCAG and just say, okay, we want to have our own residential postal users action group 
And that's described in uh, Chris's book, First Class. Do get it. Get it if you can right now from City Lights. Thanks, Ralph. I'm going to take a question from Linda. Uh, she says, how can we get rid of the pre-funding requirement? I would think Congress would have to pass another law to reverse this, but it's unclear if it's important to the Democrats, much less the Republicans. So on our, on our theme of what we can all do, Chris, can you talk a little bit about the current legislation in Congress? Yeah, there's a, it's called the Postal Service Act of 2021. Um, I don't actually remember the exact uh, legislation number Three, right now. 3076. Okay, thank you. Um, but it's, its main uh, objective, really, I mean, it, it, it will enshrine six-day delivery. There's some other things in there, too. But the main thing it does is it gets rid of the pre-funding requirement. It addresses that, 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 that whole burden. And it has been um, moving along, um, and there is momentum there in a way that there has not been in, in years. Uh, so I think it is actually, there's a real potential that it, that it could happen. But again, it's something where uh, legislators in Congress are going to have to hear uh, from their constituents. and. Um, so let them know that you want that change made. Great. So here's a comment, not really a question from Phil. He says, stick a stamp onto your physical letter to your member of Congress. Tell them what it means to you. I'm just scrolling through the chat, guys. Give me a second. Uh, great idea, Chris. I'll give one. Uh, I just purchased one to give to my local post office and I'll buy one more. Uh, someone else asks about the disappearance of the blue uh, postal boxes to pick up letters. Chris, do you have any information about that? Yeah, it's, it's just been an ongoing thing for decades where they have these cost estimates that are, are frankly hard to understand how they could potentially be that expensive to collect the mail from them. And as a result, they'll do these uh, studies and then they'll decide that this one isn't getting enough letters per day and then they will um, remove it. So I think the, the number of those blue mailboxes has like halved in the last um, 40, 50 years at the same time that the population of the country has gone up over 100 million. So um, like, like Ralph was saying, you have to get in your car sometimes to, to find one. I once suggested to the uh, unit in the Postal Service looking for new ideas that they uh, they have a place in the post office where families can come with young children and show them how to write a letter. Uh, I heard a few uh, months ago where an eight-year-old uh, asked a, her, her mother, uh, where do you put the stamp? They didn't know where to put the stamp on. Letter writing in print by children is very important. We have to rescue that tradition and expand it. We don't have any collected letters anymore. There used to be famous letters, you know, from John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. It's hard to see a collection of emails between people these days. Although my sister, who teaches anthropology at Berkeley, did put out a collection of her letters over the past 55 years, and it's, it's a recovery of lost history. So they liked that idea, by the way, when I suggested it to the post office, but they never did anything with it. Uh, there are youngsters now who would say to their parents, what's a letter? So we're, we're rupturing a terribly important tradition. And one way to introduce youngsters to the post office is bring them down. And if there's a corner of the post office where someone can help, uh, help show them how to write a letter with their parents, it's a little exciting for these kids to, to do that. They, they spend too much time looking at screens, hour after hour after hour. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion with Ralph Nader and with Christopher Shaw. Um, I just think his book is fantastic and really urge all of you to get yourselves a copy and get another one to either give to one of your uh, letter carriers or postal workers or your public library. Um, I'm going to end with a question that I think will send it back to Peter from City Lights, and that's from Paula. She says, how can I get a signed copy of Chris's book? Peter? And of course, we've posted the link in the chat function, and uh, all copies are signed tonight, actually. So if you buy one from the City Lights website, you will get a signed copy. So Catherine, thank you so much for making a really great interlocutor. And 
And Christopher, congratulations on the book. Ralph, thank you so much. It's such an honor to have you and thank you for joining us and just, just highlighting so many of these incredible points. You really, really cut to the, uh, to the heart of the matter. Okay, well, thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you, for everyone, for coming.